Hi, I'm Brad. Doing this channel has really enlightened me in a bunch of ways. Talking about things that will be coming out in the near future in terms of VR tech has really allowed me to research things and find out about how kind of current things and past things worked. And for those of us that have been around the consumer VR landscape since at least 2016, you have seen a sort of display panel go through some changes, or at least stop being used. In my hand here, I have a OLED panel that was used in the HTC Vive. It was built by Samsung, and it gave a pretty okay resolution, really for the size. I mean, it's kind of a small display, put up to your eye. Wow. But after a couple of years of using OLED panels and VR headsets, the VR industry as a whole just started kind of going away from OLED panels to begin with. A lot of people saw this as sort of a step backward in sort of the progress of VR. OLED gave a lot of benefits for people. It had very great contrast, a lot of great blacks, and the colors were insane. But there was a lot of problems with OLED tech that really just made it kind of unbearable for most users. At least, maybe they just didn't realize it. So back in 2019, when Valve, for example, announced the Valve Index with LCD panels, people were very confused. LCD is sort of a bit older and becoming more passe as OLED technology has progressed. However, the main reason that people switched to LCD is for a few reasons. First of all, let's talk about the issues that the OLED panels had in the old headsets. The OLED back in the day were really no different than OLED used in old smartphones, except they were obviously more tailored for VR because these are very square displays, because generally you would have one display per eye to allow more IPD adjustments, and well, some headsets these days don't even have two displays, one for each eye, but that's for a whole other video. And while I was able to get this OLED display to light up purely for example, and you can see it looks like there's no really black between the pixels, really you can't really judge an OLED panel based on the resolution. Because in VR, you do something very different than what you do for a normal, well, panel that you put up to your face either with a phone or TV. You put optics in front of it. Basically most if not all optics in the consumer VR market are really something called passive lenses. They don't really do anything except magnify and bend the light to make a better image for the eyes. The HTC Vive, for example, uses Fresno, which has a lot of benefits, but again, that's a whole other topic because a lot of people also do not like Fresno lenses to begin with either. But anyway, when you magnify a screen, you will start noticing all the weaknesses that some OLED panels have when it comes to VR. The biggest new weaknesses were the obvious screen door effect. The sort of black lines you would see in between all the individual pixels, which really would make you feel like you're looking through a screen door. Even if you were to increase the resolution for these OLED panels, it wouldn't actually solve the screen door effect. Because up until now, OLED just wasn't really planned for this sort of use case scenario. This is evident in the HTC Vive Pro, which actually has the same resolution as the Valve Index, but still uses OLED. It's very noticeable screen door effect using the Vive Pro compared to the Valve Index. Another thing is LCDs were always known to give off much higher values of brightness. Higher nits is really good for VR because the more light you have, the better chance of having something called a lower persistence you will be able to achieve. Ghosting is something that people might not even notice in their original VR headsets with OLED, but it was a severe problem. Especially as you try to actually increase the refresh rates from some of these OLED panels, this ghosting or high persistence would be even more evident. But of course, LCD wasn't perfect either because you lost a lot of that true great contrast values and some other more factors that some people to this day will not even switch to an LCD headset because they are just so addicted to the color reproduction that OLED can actually bring. So yeah, pixel fill rate, how many pixels you can fit in between each other, and really low persistence is the main reason that LCD kind of took over. But I didn't make this video to talk about why sort of we switched to LCD. I'm more making this video to talk about a huge change in the VR and AR industry for that matter that is actually switching back to OLED. The people watching that were probably pretty bummed out by the fact that we switched to LCD are probably going to be very happy to learn that within the next year you're probably going to see a lot more use cases for OLED returning to VR. The main reason is a brand new technology, well, actually not brand new, but a technology that has been matured enough to be very useful for VR and AR use cases. In fact, there's a reason why it's been more useful recently than ever. I mean, even PSVR 2 has been leaked to be using OLED, 
which is pretty crazy because we know they're putting a lot of R&D in that headset as we speak for release next year. So this display in my hand looks pretty small, right? An OLED panel from 2016. Well, really, in the scheme of things, compared to something called OLED micro displays, these are actually quite large. I talked about it a little bit in previous videos, but this video is really to dive in a little bit more. It's a technology that's been really maturing very fast to really be in use for the consumer VR and AR sector. They are these really tiny screens that can pack in a ton of pixels depending on the actual pixel arrangement and reach up to resolutions of up to 4K. Smaller than these. In fact, in some cases, literally one third the size of this. Some of them in production even have lower persistence than the LCD that we're seeing in some of the consumer VR headsets now because they are reaching brightness levels of up to 5,000 nits. That is very important because the higher brightness, the less artifacting you'll have in your actual VR headsets, depending on the optics. In fact, optics are a huge reason why these tiny displays are actually becoming more possible for use in VR and AR. I talked about earlier how, really, these lenses here are just magnifying an image. Except they're passive. There's nothing really going through them to make them really do much other than just sit in front of your eyes at a certain focal point. But we're seeing some huge advances in the lens industry that's allowing these OLED micro displays to actually be more functional in terms of consumer and VR and AR uses. We're seeing stuff being in the works to allow liquid crystal lenses to actually actively change and bend light to the user's eyes. Not only that, pancake lens systems, they, again, isn't something you're going to see very soon to sort of replace what we have now, is a new type of lens system that will also give more benefits to allow these tinier displays to actually work. We're actually already seeing some OLED micro displays in some, well, maybe not consumer products, but we're already seeing it in the VR sector. Varjo, which is a very high price, but very high quality VR headset, has been using OLED micro displays in their headsets since, well, the VR Varjo VR2. But due to the fact that they have a passive asymmetrical lens rather than an active one with actual electronizing photons to actually pass the image to the eye, they have to supplement that OLED micro display with a background LCD panel. The second gen series of Varjo headsets had a lower resolution of both micro display and the back panel LCD display, but the newer generation Varjo headsets, which again also include this OLED micro display, have reached a 2K by 2K resolution for just the little front panel that really is situated for the center of your view to begin with. Anyone that's used a more recent Varjo headset can literally attest to their crazy claim that it's reaching near human eye resolution. It is insane resolution for sure, and it will reach a greater clarity with a more active lens as we get more consumer friendly. In fact, there's actually probably going to be a big deep dive on that Varjo XR3 headset pretty soon on this channel to talk more about this. Now let's go talk about a little bit about the PSVR2. I said early in the video that it's been literally leaked that the PSVR2 will be using an OLED panel. And it is my belief personally that they will probably be using this new OLED micro display technology for their headsets. Even if you go to the Sony website that's really designed for getting people to want to manufacture their technologies, they have an OLED micro display page that even really shows off how they really think it's good for VR and AR uses. It's also been reported that both Sony and Oculus are using the same manufacturer to manufacture a brand new, more complex type of lenses than we see in current gen, at least Oculus devices. It's very important to note that uh, in my last previous videos about Index 2, I talked about how the Valve's new lens systems seem to really focus on OLED, or at least boosting the quality of OLED for use case and actual clarity and visuals. And while I don't think that the PSVR 2 or the Quest 3 or Quest 2 Pro coming out next year will not have these sort of varifocal lens systems with active lenses that actually change the photons going through them actively with electricity, I do think they're using new pancake lenses that literally allow OLED micro displays to be used in these products. I also mentioned how these displays are tiny, and while I do not think they're going to be the size of a quarter like some micro displays reach because the smaller they are, the more difficult the optics have to be. This also adds a huge factor to why having smaller displays is important. Form factors! Up until now, you can say that some companies have been really releasing bricks of a headset. Like, we just wear these giant heavy bricks, and some of them give off huge heat. Especially the Vive Pro 2. It has a 5K LCD panel, and, um, yeah, you really feel the heat in that headset. And while you can sort of fix the heat problem given off by these heavy resolution LCD displays with better cooling, 
that sort of adds another factor that adds more weight and form factor to be planned for the design. Especially for PCBR headsets that is not really focused that much on active cooling since a lot of them don't really have in board processing. Very basic boards. So by shrinking the displays and allowing the optics to magnify the displays further, that actually allows more form factors to get much smaller and kind of more to more cyberpunky goggles than what we would expect years ago. And on the other side of things, by shrinking the size of the displays, it also allows for a lot more robust features in headsets that don't completely remove their sort of brick size. It's like how people complain that the iPhones are getting thinner. Whereas a lot of people really would like an iPhone with maybe not cutting off any thinness, but actually including a bigger battery for more usability. The same case could apply for VR headsets. The smaller displays get and the more room that you can fit more stuff in, such as like an IPD motor display or something like that. I should also talk about the future of OLED micro displays. While I believe that most displays coming out in the next year are going to be 2K by 2K per eye, 4K put together, we see a ton of OLED micro display manufacturers looking into increasing that resolution quite a bit. Emagin in particular has a display that is very small but packs in 4K by 4K per eye. While that is a lot of resolution drive, maybe less worrisome when you have something like fovea rendering, that is some insane future proofing in terms of what we might see in the next couple years after the industry is switching back to these new type of OLED panels. So high brightness, low persistence, no screen door effect, higher resolutions, lower form factor, and just overall better weight to allow more features. Switching back to OLED and this new type of OLED I talked about in this video is sort of next gen. So as we kiss this OLED panel goodbye, it's only going to be replaced by a much better one, and we'll be saying goodbye for LCD probably forever at that point. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope you have a very clear day.